Welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast, where we engage with esteemed thought leaders and explore research-backed strategies and techniques that empower leaders at every level to achieve meaningful results that drive lasting change. Well, welcome to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Matt Abrahams, who is a passionate, collaborative, and innovative educator, author, podcast host, and coach. He teaches two very popular classes at Stanford's University's Graduate School of Business on strategic communication and effective virtual presenting. In addition to his teaching, Matt is a much sought after keynote speaker and communicator, communication consultant for Fortune 100 companies, and he's especially interested in applying communication knowledge to real world issues, which we love and we talk about all the time here on the Good Leadership Podcast is trying to make everything actionable. Now, he has two great books. His first book was Speaking Up Without Freaking Out, now in its third edition. But today, we're going to talk about his new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, a great book filled with actionable advice to become better communicator, especially at those spontaneous communication opportunities. Welcome to the program, Matt. Charles, I am delighted to be with you, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Before we get started unpacking some of these great nuggets from the book, can you share a bit about your background and really what got you interested in the field of communication and public speaking? Well, I can trace my interest in communication back to when I was a little boy. There's some very specific incidents that happened. Uh, I'll give you a quick taste of it. My brother and I had a lot of toys and things, and my mother, when I was about seven or eight, said, we're having a garage sale. We got to get rid of this. And I grew up in a community where there were garage sales every weekend. And my mother said, in order for us to stand out, we have to misspell our sign. And so if you insert a B in garage, you get garbage. So we had a garbage sale. Everybody else had a garage sale. We sold more stuff that weekend than anybody. My mother to this day is convinced that it's because our sign stood out. I think people thought we were stupid and they'd get better deals, but it does not matter. At that moment, I realized language communication can influence people. And then you know, all the way through my education, I've been fascinated by communication. I thought I was going to be a doctor when I went to undergrad. I met chemistry and calculus. They convinced me I was wrong. Uh, and then I found my true passion in communication. And that's what I went on to study, worked in the corporate world for about a decade. And now I'm back teaching communication skills. When it's such an important topic for everyone, including leaders, and really the communication piece that you focus on is that spontaneous high stakes conversations that people really don't like or have a lot of anxiety over. And you start by saying that you need to tame the anxiety monster. And the goal is not to eradicate it, the anxiety, rather it's to prevent it from hampering us. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, absolutely. So anxiety looms large in all communication, be it planned or spontaneous. And we need to learn to manage it. I don't think personally we can ever truly overcome our anxiety around speaking. Those of us who study it believe it's innate to being human. It's part of who we are. So we need to learn to manage it so it doesn't manage us. And there are two primary ways of dealing with this. They're dealing with symptoms as well as sources. So symptoms are the things that we physiologically experience. I turn red and I perspire. I don't know, Charles, what happens to you when you get nervous speaking in front of others? Well, I like how you break it down with the ABCs because I think I have all of those when I'm in a stressful situation. So I feel stress, pressured, sweating, blushing, stammering. <laughs> all of it. Yeah. So the ABCs stand for affective, behavioral, and cognitive. So affective is the emotional response we have. Behavioral is the physical signs. And then cognitive is what goes on in our head. And when it comes to managing anxiety, we need to manage all of those symptoms. So for example... I might take a deep belly breath, making sure my exhale is longer than my inhale. That can slow down a lot of the behavioral signs and symptoms. For the effective emotional ones, I can remind myself that anxiety is normal and natural. It's Most people would get nervous in the circumstance I'm in, and that gives me a little bit of space where I can do things to manage, like take a walk around the building, take a deep breath. And then cognitively, I have to remind myself that I, as a communicator, am in service of the audience that I'm speaking to. Many of us turn that spotlight on ourselves, and we really focus on, am I doing this right? Is this, am I the right person to be doing this? I should have said it differently. Instead of saying, I'm here in service of the audience, which puts me other focus, which takes me out of that negative self-talk. So those are ways to manage the ABCs of the symptoms we experience. But then there are a whole bunch of sources. 
the, uh, a big source that many of us struggle with is the goal we're trying to achieve. The goal makes us nervous. My students want to get a good grade. The entrepreneurs I coach want to get funding. You might want support for some initiative. So what's making us nervous is the potential negative outcome, not achieving that. So in order to counteract that, the future, we have to get present oriented. So we can do lots of things to get present oriented. Have a really de- in-depth conversation or connection with somebody before you speak. Walk around the building, do something physical. Actors and actresses will shake their body out to get in their body. Do like an athlete, listen to a song or a playlist. Personally, I say tongue twisters and that sounds silly, but it warms up my voice and it gets me present oriented. So managing anxiety is critical. We have to manage those ABC symptoms and we have to manage sources. And when we do that, we can be more confident in our communication. Great advice. I see this happen a lot to speakers when they get up, they get anxious before they start speaking. And a common advice normally given to people is just calm yourself down. Try to do something to calm yourself down. You say that's not the best strategy. Instead, reframe anxiety as excitement. Yeah. So there's a lot of reframing that we can do. And this is work done by my friend and and colleague, Allison Woods Brooks, that that did research. She's at Harvard right now, that looks at how we can see speaking differently. If you think about it, most of the physiological responses we have when we get nervous are exactly identical to those that we have when we get excited. In fact, our body primarily has one arousal response. The difference is how we label it. So if I came to you and I said, hey, Charles, you just won the lottery. Your heart rate would go up. You might turn red. You you might sweat a little bit, but you're really excited about that. But if I said, you know what, Charles, your colleague can't make the presentation tomorrow. You need to do it. Your heart rate would go up, you'd turn a little red, you'd sweat a little, but that situation you're labeling very negatively. So if we can see these signs as excitement and convince ourselves that we're excited, all of a sudden, not only do we feel less nervous, Allison's research suggests we actually perform better. So it's a good thing to do and a good technique to try to leverage. I've used it effectively and I can tell you firsthand that it does work. The other issue that I've seen that I've experienced personally as well is that you just, during a presentation, you blank out. You forget what you want to say. You give some great strategies in the book on what to do in those cases where whatever's next is just not coming to mind. Yes. And that happens to me. It happens to a lot of people. So two bits of advice for managing when you actually blank out. There's some other things we will talk about in a little bit you can do to reduce the likelihood of that. When you blank out, do as you do if you lost your phone or lost your keys. Go back to go forward. Many of us retrace our steps when we lose our our phones or our keys. Simply repeat yourself. We often feel like repeating myself sounds bad or in some way people are judging. In fact, we repeat ourselves a lot. We say the same thing over and over again. We remind our audiences of what we just said. I just said the same thing three times. It's not that bad. Often when you repeat yourself, it gets you back on track. You know, when I was a kid, I had this Tyco train set. I don't know, Charles, you might have remembered. It's like these little motorized trains. And when the train would fall off the track, the way you put it on is you put it on the track and then you moved it backwards. And that's what got it started again. That's exactly what we do when we blank out. Now, if that doesn't work, though, another technique that can be very useful is to distract your audience by asking a question. So there are times I teach the same strategic communication class twice a quarter, every quarter, and I've done that for 13 years. There are times where I can't remember, did I say this in this class? What's supposed to come next? So what I'll do is I'll just stop and I'll just pause and I'll say to all my students, let's pause for a moment. And I'd like for you to think about how what we've just discussed can be applied to your life. And my students don't think, oh, Matt forgot. My students think, how does this apply to my life? All of us can have a question that we can ask that will work in most situations that will get us out of the trouble of not knowing what to say, because while they're thinking of the answer, you have those few seconds to formulate where you need to go next. So I encourage everybody to have a back pocket question that you can pull out. And just knowing you have that question in your back pocket reduces the likelihood that you'll ever need to use it because you feel confident that you can do something if you blank out. So go back to go forward. Have a question that you can use to distract people, and that will get you through blanking out. Great advice around those two areas. The other thing that happens when you get anxietous, you don't want to stop talking for any period of time. So you put a lot of filler language into 
your speech. You have a great method that we talked about before we started recording today on how do you remove this filler language? I never knew about this method, but it works. So listeners pay attention. Yeah, I love it. And I love that that you're finding value in it. So filler words, the goal with filler words is not to eliminate all of them. It's normal and natural to have some. In fact, screenwriters and playwrights, they actually put filler words in dialogue because when they don't have it, it sounds artificial. But the goal is to not have so many that they're distracting. And the ones that distract most are the ones that come in silence between my phrases and my sentences. So when I'm done talking um, and then I start again, that really sits out there and, and that becomes very distracting. A way to get around these is through what I call landing your phrases. I'd like everybody listening to envision a gymnast doing their twists and twirls and flips, and then they stick the landing. If you imagine ending each of your phrases and sentences, sticking the landing, and by that I mean getting yourself to where you're completely out of breath, you have to inhale before you can start speaking again. This does two great things for you. One, it builds in a pause. Pauses are important. People who have higher status and power in certain contexts will absolutely pause more than those who have lower status and power. So you actually are seen as more confident and competent by pausing. But the other thing is you can't say anything when you're inhaling. I challenge everybody to try. The next time you have a moment, try to say something while you're inhaling. You can't do it. Speaking is an exit only event. You have to push air out. So if I am completely out of breath when I'm done speaking, I inhale, I can't say um, I build in a pause, and then I move on to my next phrase. So here's how I recommend you practice. I believe the best way to take on new habits is associate them with existing habits. Charles, you and I are probably like everybody listening. We all check our calendar or schedule every day, maybe multiple times a day. Once a day, whenever you look at your calendar, I'd like you to speak the next three or four events out loud. You're already looking at it. Now just say them out loud. And at the end of each one, try to get yourself completely out of breath. So I might say, go to the gym and exercise. Do a podcast with Charles. Have dinner with Joe. Each one of those sentences ends with me completely being out of breath. And doing that kind of drill becomes natural for when I normally communicate and I have no filler words as I go through. Love that. That's so good. I just started using it. It's definitely effective and it really helps to curtail those filler words that you put at the beginning or at the end of when you start talking within a conversation or for a podcast. So you have lots of actionable advice. The other piece of it is where you kind of bring everything together is you need to identify a personalized anxiety management plan. And it's great that you put it into an acronym because people aren't going to remember all this unless it's something that's relevant to them. So you have all this great advice, maybe put those three to four to five things that you encounter or you struggle with frequently into an acronym and have that acronym handy, memorize it so you can remind yourself of that before an event. Absolutely. You know, when it comes to managing anxiety, you need to be prepared because you never know, especially in a spontaneous speaking situation, when it's going to be needed. So there are many, many techniques for managing anxiety. We talked about symptoms and sources, many techniques for each. My first book was called Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. It had 50 techniques based on academic research. I don't expect all 50 to work for any one person. I'm happy if three to five techniques work. So once you identify techniques that work for you, the next step is to put them into some logical plan that you can remember. And I've been doing this for decades with my students, and I still have students from years and years ago who will write me to let me know they're still using their plans. In fact, just two weeks ago, a former student, unfortunately, had a relative pass away and he gave the eulogy and he used his plan to help him manage the jitters that he had before going up. So let me give you an example of a plan. This is my plan. I do three things to help me manage anxiety. The first thing I do because I blush and perspire is I always hold something cold in the palm of my hands. When you get nervous, your heart beats faster, your body tenses up, your blood pressure goes up. It's like you're exercising and we sweat and perspire and blush when we exercise. To cool ourselves down, holding something in the palm of our hands can cool our 
core body temperature down. So we sweat and blush less. So I always hold a bottle of water. I always say my tongue twister. I talked about that a few moments ago. And then finally, I remind myself that I am in service of my audience. It's very easy for me to get in my head and say negative thoughts and talk about how I could have prepared differently or better. And I just remind myself, I am here in service of my audience. There's value I have to bring. And that helps me get other focus. So those are the three techniques I've been using for a long, long time. And they help me to get through these nerve wracking situations. Just curious, Matt, what is that tongue twister that you say to yourself, if you wouldn't mind? I will share it with you, Charles, on one condition. You repeat it after me. You up for that? I will do my best. Okay. So it's three phrases, takes five seconds. And the reason I like this is if you say it wrong, you say a naughty word. So we might have to bleep this out if one of us makes a mistake. So, so repeat after me. I slit a sheet. I slit a sheet. A sheet I slit. A sheet I slit. And on that slitted sheet I sit. And on that slitted sheet I sit. Very good. I say that three times really fast, and that warms me up, warms up my voice, and gets me very present-oriented. And both of those are important for me to feel less nervous. Wonderful. Well, now, how about, I love for us to move into kind of reframing failure because communication, a lot of people have perfectionistic tendencies. They think it needs to be done the right way all the time, and they don't like to think of themselves as doing anything that's not perfect. But I love your analogy that you brought from mistakes that are really just missed takes from Hollywood. Explain that to our listeners and how that helps them to kind of redefine the purpose of communication. Yeah, absolutely. So the etymology, the origin of the word communication is to make common. So our goal is really to connect with other people and share information. Yet many of us want to do it right, as if there is a right way to communicate. I've been doing this a long, long time. And I am here to tell you, Charles, there is no right way to communicate. There are better ways and worse ways, but there is no one right way. Yet we want to give the right answer to the question, the best feedback, the most. In, we want to be the most interesting during small talk. And that actually puts a tremendous amount of pressure on ourselves. So I like to tell people it's about connection, not perfection. We need to dial down that self-evaluation. One great way to do that is to use techniques that shift our mindset. One that I particularly find useful is exactly what you brought up. Many of us see mistakes as bad, even though we know as young kids, that's how we learn. We learn through making mistakes. So a great way to reframe mistakes is missed takes. If you know anything about film or television, when they record a scene, they do it multiple times. They call these takes and they even have that clapboard, take one, take two. And when you think to yourself, whenever I communicate, I'm just doing a take. And if it doesn't go the way I want, that's okay. I'm just going to do another take. Movie directors will have the actor do it standing or do it sitting, do it from this perspective or that perspective. No one take is right. They're just trying to find a better, more interesting, more connective way to do it. And the same is true with our communication. So when you see your communication as a series of takes, any one take is okay. You just move on to the next take. And I sometimes to myself would simply in my mind when something doesn't go the way I exactly had thought it would, I just say take two and I just keep moving. So it can be very useful. It takes the teeth out of making mistakes which allows you to connect better. Absolutely. Another reframe that you mentioned is make it about conversations, not performances, which has been really helpful for me. That's right. You know, many of us, there are a couple of things I'd like to say here. One, the, the closest analogy many of us have to big presentations is other performances. Maybe we've done singing, dancing, acting, played a sport. In all of those situations, there is a right way to do it. You know, if you were a, an actor and you misspeak a line, You've messed it up for everybody on the stage, the lighting people. If you're an athlete and you don't do what's required at the right time in the right way, you make a mistake. In fact, some sports keep track of the errors you make. That's not speaking in the moment, though. Yet we bring that analogy to it, and that's how we think. So we see it as a performance when it's not. So we need to envision it as something else, which is a conversation. And the other thing that gets in the way is these big formal talks that have become very popular in the last decade or so. I love TED Talks. I've coached TED speakers. I've spoken at, at several TED events. 
Yet that's not spontaneous speaking. And many of us see that as the right way to speak. And we judge ourselves against that. Everyday conversation is not a TED talk. And by the way, TED speakers are heavily coached, and some of those talks are actually even edited. So we're comparing ourselves to an unrealistic standard for a situation that we're not in. So we have to get rid of this performance mentality and remind ourselves it's just a conversation. Most people are not as stressed in conversation as they are in performance. Absolutely. And another reframe that really helps, that really helped me, and I saw this in your book as well, is when you think about your audience, remind yourself that in most cases, they want you to succeed. They're not here to throw a wrench into what you're trying to say. If you flipped the roles and you were the audience, would you want to see the presenter, the educator, the speaker flounder? If you have invited someone to the event, you want them to be successful, right? So that reframe also helps in calming those nerves and getting you in the right mindset. Absolutely. You said it very well. Uh, I'll just echo what you said. Most audiences are there to learn from you, to connect to you, to gain some value. And they don't like to watch people fail. In fact, it's really awkward to watch a really nervous speaker present or somebody who's flailing around. Nobody wants that experience. So when you remind yourself that people are looking for success, looking for value from you, that can take some of the pressure off. And when you do make a mistake, a great insight from Coach K, right, is focus on the next play. Focus on the task at hand. Don't ruminate about what happened because whatever you've just done is not nearly as important as what you're doing right now. That's exactly right. Yes. So I learned this actually from a basketball, a youth basketball coach for my younger son. When my son was 10, he had an amazing coach and the coach was teaching the kids next play. And I asked him, well, what is this all about? And he, he told me and introduced me to the coach uh, K, Mike Krzyzewski, uh, and he inculcated this in all of his players. What's most important is what you're doing now. It's not what just happened. It's not what's happening next. And yet athletes can get really locked up in ruminating or celebrating, and that takes them away from the moment. If you're a basketball player and you miss a shot and you waste a moment beating yourself up over missing that shot, your team and the other team are down the court likely to score and you're not there helping defend. So we need to move on to next play. Now, this does not say that we should not do reflection at some point. We should. Rumination in the moment is very different than reflection after the fact. So I encourage everybody, when you're done at the end of your day, think through, and I do this every day, I do this. I think about what's one thing that went well in my communication today? What's one thing that could have gone better? And then I don't do more than just reflect. And at the end of every week, I look back and I look for patterns and I might see patterns over the week where I'm seeing certain things that went really well, certain things that didn't. And that's what I look to change. So next play is all about being present, not ruminating and teaching yourself to reflect after the fact, not in the midst of it. I hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights. If it has, I ask you to share it with someone who would also benefit from it. If you've been enjoying and gaining knowledge from this podcast, then subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the previous episodes of the podcast and additional learning resources. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple or Spotify and leave up to a five-star review.